Sepsis and septic shock are extraordinarily common in critical care. For centuries, people developed septic shock, died, and science really didn't have an explanation for it. But then when the germ theory was recognized, we learned that sepsis is caused by infections, caused by microorganisms. But it really it wasn't until Osler said, the patient appears to die from the body's response to infection rather than from it, that we started to actually understand septic shock. One of the first problems with sepsis is a clear definition. This lack of clarity created confusion with research. So in the early 1990s, the American College of Chest Physicians and Society of Critical Care Medicine agreed on a consensus statement of the definition of sepsis and septic shock. Now sepsis is simply defined as an infection and at least two SERS criteria. Severe sepsis occurs when a patient has sepsis and evidence of acute organ dysfunction. And then lastly, a septic shock is sepsis with refractory hypotension despite adequate fluid resuscitation. Understanding these definitions is a core concept in critical care, even if the sensitivity and specificity of this criteria is still being debated in the literature. Rapidly identifying the source of an infection is critical in the rapid treatment of sepsis. When time is of the essence, knowing where to start is a key. Not surprisingly, sepsis most likely occurs in regions of the body that are constantly exposed to the environment. The source of septic shock is the respiratory tract about 40% of the time. This is followed by the gastrointestinal tract 30% of the time, and then the genital urinary tract 15% of the time. So consider these sources first in your investigations, and you will likely reveal the cause of the infection. Patients with a variety of chronic diseases, HIV, cancer, and even diabetes can alter both the bacterial flora and modify the potential sources of infection. So for example, a patient with diabetes is more susceptible to developing a foot ulcer infection, cellulitis, and Fournier's gangrene. As well, you need to consider regional and seasonal variations in causes, as you can expect to see seasonal variations of viral infections like influenza. Over the last century, we've learned that sepsis is not the result of the infection alone, but it's also the response of the body. This response is generally called inflammation, and for most of the 20th century, was treated as a single entity. We now understand sepsis to be more than just an exaggerated inflammatory response, but a complex interplay between the infection and the host response. So for example, streptococcus can produce an exotoxin, that this can cause a toxic shock syndrome when it's in the right host environment. The host response varies in intensity, but will generally follow a consistent pattern starting with a good surface defense of the epithelial layer. If this fails, then macrophages and neutrophil activation occurs while mobilizing a lymphocyte response. Concurrent with the immunological response, families of cytokines, complement, and members of the coagulation pathways become activated. Cytokines are the singling pathway that regulate both endothelial and platelet function, as well as neutrophil activation and attraction. These activated neutrophils produce reactive oxygen species used to kill the invaders. But these oxidants frequently spill out into the space around the infection and can cause bystander collateral damage. Both cytokines and reactive oxygen species can spread throughout the body, causing a body-wide reaction. Complement activation, on the other hand, can occur through many different mechanisms at the site of the infection. They cause microbial death by producing a membrane attack complex that explodes the bacteria. The released contents from the dead bacteria accelerate other inflammatory systems. Interestingly, the coagulation pathway was only recently recognized as a critical part of the host defense. This was discovered when it was found that comp components of the complement pathway and cytokines could induce clotting. But when you think about it, it makes sense, as there is an evolutionary advantage to having an infected region of the body excluded from the general blood population. But this also causes regional cellular hypoxemia, ischemia, and vascular shunting. As well, byproducts of the coagulation pathway, activation feeds into activation of the cytokines and the complement systems as well. Sepsis is a total body problem, and patients with septic shock will have almost every single organ system affected, 
but even without a whole body infection. Even when the brain is not directly involved in an infection, it is frequently a victim. This can manifest as a delirium or a septic encephalopathy. The exact mechanism behind this is unclear, and it's thought to be cytokine-induced neurotransmitter alterations. Cytokines can also cause a significant myocardial depression with a dilated systolic heart failure. Vasodilation and capillary leak are a necessary ingredient in septic shock. The mechanism behind this is nitric oxide effects on the endothelium. The combination of more vascular space and a loss of fluid into the interstitium can cause hypotension and a relative volume depletion. The lungs get the entire blood volume every minute, so you really shouldn't be surprised that they are a frequent victim of systemic inflammation. On top of this, the lungs are also the source of the infection almost half of the time. The lungs are damaged from activation of neutrophils, nitric oxide, and cytokines leading to an acute hypoxemic respiratory failure and acute respiratory distress syndrome. The bowels can be a problem in two ways. First, there may be the source of the infection, and second, they can potentiate systemic inflammation. Peripheral vasodilation can cause small vessel and small bowel ischemia, while a lack of enteric nutrition causes enterocyte loss. Remember that enterocytes rely on enteric nutrition to survive and not the blood supply. Now, the bowels become more permeable, permitting bacteria and endotoxins to translocate into the bloodstream. Acute kidney injury also frequently occurs in septic shock and is a marker of mortality. The development of acute kidney injury effectively doubles your mortality risk from the underlying infection. The infection is, injury is caused by both vasodilation-induced hypoperfusion and the direct toxic effects from cytokines. Compounding this, aggressive fluid resuscitation and a capillary leak can cause an abdominal compartment syndrome, decreasing renal perfusion. Sepsis and septic shock can present in many different ways, so it's critical to maintain a high index of suspicion. A key component of making the diagnosis is to get a complete history and physical. You should also specifically look for the SERS criteria. A clinical examination should be from the head to the toe, looking for evidence of meningitis, all the way down to diabetic foot ulcers. Now, if the patient is obviously critically ill, then treatment needs to be concurrent with your diagnosis. Fortunately, initial investigations don't really need to be esoteric. If you can get a general set of laboratory tests and a chest x-ray, you're probably on the right path to an answer. Culture any available body fluid, such as blood, urine, and sputum. Now, blood cultures are most likely to be positive if drawn before antibiotics are given. But that being said, if the patient's critically ill, time is of the essence and antibiotics before cultures may be necessary. Other investigations in cultures should be guided by your initial findings and can include things such as CT scans of the chest, lumbar punctures, paracentesis, and thoracentesis. It should almost go without saying that patients who are in septic shock require intensive care. I mean, these are patients who are vasopressor dependent despite fluid resuscitation and are still hemodynamically unstable. I mean, where do you think they're going to go? But never forget that critical care is a mindset, not necessarily a place. Initiating aggressive resuscitation can occur in the emergency department, on the wards, or even out in the fields. Baseline monitoring for everyone is continuous cardiac and oxygen saturation monitoring. Almost also mandatory is an arterial line, which is a much more accurate way of measuring blood pressure instead of a non-invasive blood pressure cuff, and it provides continuous blood pressure monitoring with the bonus of easy access for blood samples. As well, a central line is almost always necessary and serves three purposes. First, it gives you rapid access to the vascular space for aggressive fluid resuscitation and vasopressors. Second, it can measure the central venous pressure to guide fluid therapy. And third, a blood sample gives you a central venous oxygen saturation, which is a measure of oxygen delivery. Patients with septic shock frequently have complicated hemodynamics, but multiple studies have shown that there is no benefit to a pulmonary arterial catheter unless inserted to answer a more specific question. More importantly, to really emphasize you should not postpone aggressive resuscitation while you're inserting these monitoring devices. There are six mainstays to the treating patients with septic shock. Antibiotics, source control, fluids, vasopressors, inotropes, and steroids. Obviously, any patient with septic shock requires antibiotics, and they should be given as soon as possible. 
Studies have demonstrated an increasing risk of death of 8% per hour after the first episode of hypotension, so don't delay. Your coverage should be broad, looking to treat what is both probable and include both gram-negative and gram-positive organisms. Whether you use single or combination coverage will largely depend on your local practices. But your coverage can also be adjusted based on your history and your physical examination. So for example, you may need to add SEPTRA if there's a suspicion of PJP. Lastly, consider your local ecology and antibiotic resistance factors. There is no point giving ineffective antibiotics and it only increases the patient's risk of death. Concurrent with resuscitation and antibiotics, removing the infection source should be a priority. In fact, infections like intra-abdominal abscesses can't be cured any other way. Antibiotics alone will not fix these problems. As you proceed with resuscitation, also focus on draining any abscesses and removing any infected lines. As should be clear by now, hypovolemia is the immediate problem in septic shock. Resuscitation requires aggressive fluids and any flavor will do. There's, there's no evidence that one particular type of fluid is better than another, so check with your local practices when you're picking. All fluids should be given in quick boluses and the effects should be closely monitored to avoid over-resuscitation. Even after the tank is full, you, must, you still must deal with the vasodilation that is part and parcel of the septic shock. Norepinephrine is the drug of choice in sepsis, but there are many other vasopressors available, but they're just not as well studied. The dose of nor norepinephrine is up to 0.3 micrograms per kilogram per minute, but sometimes you need to exceed the maximum in order to keep the mean arterial pressure over 65 millimeters of mercury. If hypotension persists despite a high dose of vasopressors, then consider whether the patient is still hypovolemic and give more fluids if necessary. Once you've resuscitated the intervascular space and relieved vasodilation, there may still be signs of shock. Inotropes may have a role, and they work in two ways. First, they reduce the afterload and relieve some of the myocardial depression of sepsis. And second, microvascular shunting can lead to hypoxemia, and inotropes can cause vasodilation, reducing the amount of shunt and improving oxygen delivery. To determine whether you need to add an inotrope, you need to get a central venous oxygen saturation. When the central venous oxygen saturation is below 75%, an inotrope can be tried. Finally, the story of steroids in sepsis is like a pendulum. Although adrenal deficiency in sepsis is a thing, the exact role of steroid replacement comes and goes. There may be benefit in replacement when patients have refractory shock or high vasopressor requirements. Obviously, you should also replace corticosteroids in patients who have a known pre-existing history of adrenal insufficiency. Today we covered sepsis and septic shock. We discussed the definition of sepsis using the criteria established by the Society of Critical Care Medicine and reviewed the multiple sources of sepsis. We also briefly went over some of the pathophysiology of septic shock and discussed the various organ failures that can occur and concluded by talking about how we can diagnose and treat sepsis using a combination of antibiotics, source control, fluids, vasopressors, inotropes, and steroids. Thank you for watching. In the next video, we're going to talk about hypovolemic shock and specifically hemorrhagic shock. Until next time, thanks for watching.